played it on my 486 back in the day, man. All, all my all-in-one compact <laughs> until the green smoke came out of it. And <laughs> then, then the, the magic green smoke comes out of your computer. You're done. This week on Backward Compatible. Jim, Doc, and Chris talk about optimizing games and the pros and cons of pushing the limitations of the available hardware. Plus, Poyo Poyo Tetris, The Sea Eternal, our first ever Jim Beck segment, and more. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode 102 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Doc. Hey there. And today's media topic of discussion should be quite an interesting one. We're going to be talking about the limitations imposed by hardware even today, and some of the things we start to see in games, uh, for example, long loading times, um, you know, kind of trying to trading off maybe like graphical quality for quality of the design, that sort of thing. Um, things that are issues that maybe shouldn't be optimization. I mean, it's mm-hmm. all about it's all about opt- op- the optimized experience, and, and how do you do that? And what what counts as an optimized experience? Um, is it is it visuals? Is it the gameplay? Is it the mechanics? Mm-hmm. And are developers focusing on the wrong thing? I want to know whether or not we can forgive them for these design decisions. <laughs> if 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 we're past the point, I in, forgive in no our, one, as you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but but I mean, we're we're past the point where we can say video games are a new thing. Mm-hmm. We really are. Um, whether you use TV as a measurement or anything else as a measurement, you know, at what point do we simply turn away from a game because we go, this is a badly done game? Mm-hmm. And I want to preface this by saying that none of us are programmers or engineers, and so we don't know all that goes into optimizing. But we do have enough kind of exposure to the games industry that we have a better sense than some people might. But also, when it comes down to it, the consumer experience for any sort of you know artwork or you know media that you're consuming, you know, it doesn't in a way it doesn't matter whether or not something happened or something didn't happen during the development phase, it kind of just comes down to the end of product because that's what we see. It's, so, it's the decisions. We can talk mm-hmm. about the decisions that they're made even if we don't know how they might accomplish mm-hmm. it because we know that it can't be done because it mm-hmm. has been done. Yeah, and we also understand that it's very difficult. You know, game design is hard. <laughs> but it is. Uh, sure. Development is hard. But... It's extremely easy. <laughs> yeah, Jim works in QA, so he's actually paid to be critical. Yeah, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> he, Imagine that. He, he, he's paid to A the Q, so there you go. But before we get into that, we have some opening segments for you, including a very brief button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Oh, and on this one, um, Chris, game that we've been playing for, for some time. I actually recently beat it, Persona 5. I believe you're close to the end. Correct? Yeah, I think I pretty much beat it. I just need to sort of finish out the epilogue. I've enjoyed it quite a lot. I don't want to really get into spoilers, but um, I did play the hell out of it. I think my final my final time was around one thirty ish hours or so, maybe a little more. Um, where, where did you? Clock I'm in so far? right around a hundred. Okay. So um, I'd kind of like to get together. Maybe we can talk more about it in its own its own space, its mm-hmm. own episode. Mm-hmm. So we have our roundtable discussions that we do as episodes here on the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, but because it's just me and Jim who will be talking about it... Um, Persona come, sucks! <laughs> we've come up with a, uh, a new Codex uh, segment that we're going to be calling Table for Two as opposed to a roundtable. Ooh, so fancy. Um, Are we going to have the one candle on the table in the center? <laughs> I mean, we could, we could do that if we really want to. Yeah. Let's do it. Just like melt a candle on top of the microphone <laughs> in the middle of the table. Um, but Wow. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, it's classy. Mm-hmm. But we wanted to like really give this game uh, its due time to talk about it in depth rather than trying to rush it into another button mod. I support here, so. this idea because I don't have to be there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and so it should be an interesting talk, but we just kind of wanted to preview that and to uh, let you guys know that Persona 5 discussion will be happening. So with that being said, if you want to listen to it, I imagine lots of spoilers will, spoilers will be had. Um, so definitely go and play it if you care about that. Yeah, just set aside you know 80 to 120 hours between now and then and uh, play through it. Yeah, easy, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> it's 
time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. Okay, so this is an interesting game that came out on the Switch, and I think it might be available on a couple other platforms as well, but I played it on the Switch. Um, Puyo Puyo Tetris. Um, wait, wait, they have Tetris on Nintendo now? Yes. <laughs> wow! <laughs> this is an interesting game. I've, I've heard of it, and mm-hmm. I'm actually, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Tetris. and I am too. I, I've been playing Tetris, gone back to it, and been playing it a lot recently. Mm-hmm. Just a, a Tetris Ultimate, I believe it's called. Mm. Um, I've been enjoying and, and actually... Is that for PS4? PS4. Yeah. Getting, getting right back into it and, and relearning the, the techniques. And mm-hmm. So what are the differences here with Puyo, Puyo Puyo Tetris? And so for those of you who don't know Puyo Puyo, um, it is a puzzle game by Sonic <coughs> Team, interestingly enough, that is kind of like a match four or more of colors. There are these blobs that come down in pairs, mm-hmm. and they're always, at least in this game, they're always um, the same color. And so, like, you have two reds that will come down next to each other, two blues. Uh, if you ever play Dr. Mario, it reminds a little bit of that. Um, huh. Yeah. But, yeah, I've, i played a lot of Dr. Mario. But basically the idea is that when you connect four or more of these little blobs of the same color, they'll pop, and then anything on top of them will fall down. Um, and the more advanced um, gameplay that you get into with this is, like, you can just sort of try to clear it as quickly as possible. But you get... You'll do better, and it's always been a versus game, and I'll get into this in just a second, where if you get chains of you pop a bunch and then others fall, then that creates a new one that pops, and then they fall and you get another one. You can kind of get like chains of nine or more sometimes if you're really good. Um, It will actually attack the other player with a bunch of what they call junk. Um, (laughs) It's these clear ones that don't match anything that can only be removed by popping ones that are adjacent to them. You know, that reminds me of Tetris mm 2, actually. Yeah. Back in the day. And that's actually the point is, like, you know, versus Tetris, you know, you have the junk that builds up and makes it harder because you've got this, you've got less space on the screen to work with. Mm -hmm. And, of course, once you get up to the top, then, you know, you break and you lose. Mm -hmm. Do you send... um Debilitate the other side. Yes, that, that, like when you get a good combo or something like that, you send junk to the other player. Yeah, so yeah, and that's then, how the battle mode mm-hmm. works in Tetris Ultimate. Yeah. yeah, and then you can yeah. counter it by like you know clearing the junk before it falls with your own combo, and it's kind of this back and forth. Mm-hmm. Um, and so because both games kind of have that in the history, what they decided to do is combine the two, um. and they do this in some really interesting ways. You can basically just play it like you know standard Poyo versus Poyo. Um, you could have one person playing Poyo and one playing Tetris. Really? Um, you can have hmm. um, um, the, a mode that a lot of my friends really like when they tried it is one where you play, you both play Poyo, and then it counts down, and then it switches to Tetris. And you play Tetris for a while, it counts down, you switch back to Poyo, but oh, the boards crazy. stay the same. And it's actually possible sometimes to like get a big combo right before you switch, and then send the junk into the next board, that sort of thing. I like how you said switch. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and so it's it, there's some really interesting strategies there of like you know, if, say for instance you're stronger in Tetris than you are in Poyo, then like you really try to gain ground when you're in the Tetris mode and try to beat the other player there and then just sort of survive when you're in Poyo or vice versa. Um, so really, really cool stuff there. And then there's one of the more interesting modes to me is one that actually has you are you have Tetris and Poyo on the same board um, where I think what happens is that the Tetris blocks will fall through the Poyo because they're heavier and you know thicker than the Poyo. Oh, that's neat. Um, does and, it slow down as it does it? Um... I'm not sure. It might. Oh, okay. Um, but basically, yeah, you, you place it there, and then it'll kind of, like, fall down, and Puyo will sort of, like, f- you know, rise up on top of it. Mm-hmm. And you're trying to clear lines of Tetris while also getting combos of Puyo. And you can do some really interesting stuff there where um, clearing a line of Tetris might then trigger a combo of Puyo, that sort of thing. Um, so really interesting approach to making these uh, come together. And it's been getting really great reviews. Um, there's a single player adventure mode that apparently is uh, fairly well written in the sense that it's very tongue in cheek, very comedic, oh, really? light lighthearted. A story me. mode. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tetris was story, man. Mm-hmm. I've been I've been wanting this for for decades. <laughs> um, and it, it it takes on the aesthetic more of Poyo because Poyo has always kind of had sure, this thing with a, a, a story mode in it. Now, um, let me ask: mm-hmm. are, are you are you playing this? I mean, can you first of all can you play it online against you know? Yes, you can. Online strangers, okay. Mm-hmm. But I assume. Being the Switch, you can also pull out the Joy-Cons and, and play with somebody in the room. Yes. So, bringing back Couch Co-op, mm-hmm. Poyo Poyo, Tetris. Mm-hmm. And because your Switch, Story mode. Yeah, because Story your Switch mode. Automatic, automatically comes with two Joy-Con, you've got two-player mode yeah. built into it. So, Man, that is so cool. <laughs> that You just gave me a second reason to buy a Switch. <laughs> Um, so yeah, like I, I really highly recommend it. It's a fun game, really clever design. Um, and it's... 
I think it's like forty dollars, thirty or forty dollars, which um, I think is actually well worth it sure. for the quality. Of the Just game. downloadable, so, I assume. Uh, yeah, it's, it's downloadable. I'm not sure if it's got physical copies. Uh, I downloaded it. Yeah. Um, and you know, interestingly enough, I mentioned it comes from Sonic Team. I actually first was exposed to the franchise when Poyo Poyo in America was Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine, and so I only discovered this game oh, that's funny. back in the day because I had a Sonic collection that happened to include that. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> he had a Sonic collection. Yeah. You know, this is the third episode in a row he's mentioned Sonic. Yes, yes, very true. Yeah. I, I didn't. I did not realize that I had played Poyo Poyo before until you referenced uh, Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. Yep. Because I have played that game. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So now I kind of know what you're talking about before. I'm just like, wait, poyo, poyo. (laughs) So, yeah. That makes sense, though. I get it now. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's time to open up the gym bag, where the internet lets us know just how they feel about Jim's hot takes. So, uh, I've been informed by uh, my uh, co-host here that we actually had someone write in to the gym bag uh, uh, segment. (laughs) In our email. So, um, in honor of this segment, we're going to, well, in honor of uh, the email, we are actually going to ha- hold the gym bag segment um, <laughs> this episode and any other episodes that we get email. And what, what we will do is, or what I will do, is I will read through the email and go ahead and comment on it. So, <laughs> here we go. Let's see what we got here. Um, oh, and I, I'm not, I'm, the names will be protected, so I won't say who it's from, I suppose. Dear Jim, I've been listening to the Backwards Compatible for a couple of months now. <laughs> I love it, except you're an obnoxious moron, and everything you say is pure disinformation. Oh, he's not hes not obnoxious. <laughs> I can't believe they let you get a PhD in video games. Wait a minute. No, I have one now. Um, <laughs> you do? Apparently. Every word you speak does nothing but expose your vacuity to the entire world. Oh, we've got a lot of listeners, apparently. Yeah. You should be ashamed, two words, to call yourself a gamer. If you really think that modern games are that bad, then go back to the 80s and play on your Commodore 64 and leave us all alone, you mouth-breathing cretin. Wow. Wow. I can uh, confirm he does breathe through his mouth. <laughs> I, I have to say that, that what I am actually very insulted by this because... I do not play, uh, nor do I ever want to play, the Commodore 64. <laughs> I think its games are quite terrible. Um, and the fact that he would think that I enjoy the Commodore 64, I take it as a personal insult. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. And I'm sure that we can find a fine institution to give you an honorary PhD, which, of course, stands for Piled Higher and Deeper. Yes, sure. <laughs> so I'm with it. Yeah. I'm close enough. I figure it might as well. I'm, I'm close enough to PhD. Yeah. So. It's, yeah. it's true. You know, they don't call me Doc because I'm short in hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, that too. Yeah. This person is a listener. We're not. We won't reveal names. Uh, he did actually say at the at the bottom of the email that it was a joke. Mm-hmm. Um, but oh, I do, that's kind of disappointing. I, don't know, I appreciate. I appreciate the the uh, the email though. The write in. Uh, but you can also write in. Just remember to the woke gem segment we haven't had yet. Woke hashtag woke gem. Now, I haven't been woke in the last episode or this episode yet, but it might be coming. And of course, as we say at the end of every episode, that we also uh, love to hear from you guys in the inbox segment as well. Uh, if you have anything that you want to uh, suggest that we talk about or anything you want to share, yeah, write us a letter. Of course. Yeah. That's inbox at backward-compatible.com. Of course. Always willing to read it. Sometimes, first impressions don't tell the whole story. Can passion linger, or is it doomed to burn brightly, then fade away? To find the answers, we ask, are you still playing? All right, so Jim and I are going to gang up on you today, Chris, with oh, the talking. Yeah. Oh, boy. And, uh, <laughs> well, see, see, here's the thing. You you mentioned Hearthstone the other day. We haven't talked about Hearthstone in almost a year. Mm. But you were talking about new content mm-hmm. and some some new, you know, it's a new season and that kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you, are you still playing Hearthstone? Uh, not much, no. Um, it has kind of like taken a little bit of a back seat as far as my mobile gaming mm-hmm. goes. It, it used to be my go-to time burner, and now it's not. Um, and so I did play for a pretty good little burst when the new expansion came out, but I haven't really spent much time with it since. I see. Mm. Well, here's confession time. I actually knew that mm. because I've spent so much time on Hearthstone <laughs> in the last week and a half, and I haven't seen you there. Ah. <laughs> that, that I knew that was perfectly well, true. So, so I have to ask, uh, uh, Chris, mm-hmm. why did you step away from Hearthstone? 
And Doc, why did you pick it back up? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Kind of a couple questions here. I think for me, it's that, and you know, for one, Doc, I didn't know that you were actually back to playing it. I am playing uh, it. Yeah. I had like no friends really who were that into oh, it. Oh, Chris has no friends. I, I just have no friends in no, general. No. <laughs> Therefore, I don't play Hearthstone. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, That's how you uh, make friends. <laughs> uh, just I don't know. I, I don't really. When I was really into Hearthstone, I had enough people around me that were also into it yeah, that I kind of yeah. kept up to be able to talk with them. And so I kind of got on for the new expansion, experienced it, and then kind of felt like I'd experienced it enough that I wasn't that driven. Mm-hmm. I've never been huge into rank play. Um, and they've actually changed some things that make ranked play easier to climb the ladder. I agree, They're yeah. actually like milestones where once you get to it, uh, you can't fall back past it. So mm-hmm. you actually have more incentive to try to play ranked. But mm. um, I just don't have the time for it. And so... Given that I'm not serious about trying to play ranked and climb the ladder, sure, yeah. I'm not really that motivated to play all that often. Well, see, for me, it was the same kind of a reason, actually. Um, I wanted to do the new scenario, uh, but I don't I don't ever buy them. I actually get the gold mm-hmm. and then pay for it with gold, which each stage then, I think there's four of them, is about 700 gold in mm-hmm. order to do that. So to get that, you either have to do missions, mm-hmm. which is the main way of doing it. Mm-hmm. The quests. Or, yeah. yeah, quests. Or win three in a row. Mm-hmm. But you can win three in a row at... The um, what are they called? The tavern brawls. Yes. And the last few weeks of tavern brawls have actually been really fun. Mm. Um, right now, as I as we record this, uh, the tavern brawl is uh, random cards and then random cost, mm-hmm. and it's just amazing <laughs> because mm-hmm. uh, you really you have to be strategic with what you have and have no idea what's coming, mm-hmm. um, and that's fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you play cards that that'll say something like, if you have duplicates in your deck, I don't know what's in my deck. Mm-hmm. I have no idea. Right, so that's been kind of fun, um, and then on top of that, um, I, the, the, there was this neat experience that happened to me uh, when I got back into it. I had been away from it long enough that it knew that I had been, and it and it said, "Welcome back," mm. and then it said, "Here's some free stuff for coming back, ah. and here's some new quests just for you because you're back." Hmm. And when you finish that, I'm going to give you ten packs to get caught up. If you haven't played Hearthstone in a while, jump back on, mm. um, re-download your authenticator, <laughs> and reset your password, because uh, th- there's some cool free stuff for you if it's been long enough. Mm-hmm. Um, that That's my word of advice. Um, jump in, see some of the new content, see if you like it, and um, you're probably going to have to convert all of your decks from wild mode to standard mode and fix them, because whew, there's stuff that's changed. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, Hearthstone. And I was going to ask Chris, are you still playing Fire Emblem Heroes? Oh, yes. Um, actually, I am. And I mentioned that uh, Hearthstone took a back seat. It's actually to this. Um, I'm so actually, why? I'm actually I'm really into it. And what's really cool about it is they've done a great job of keeping new content coming. Um, there's, like, every now and then there'll be some new event where, like, they'll change the summoning focus. Uh, you spend orbs in order to summon characters, and so with each new focus, generally they add new characters and, like, sort of increase the chances of getting those new characters if you summon. Um, hmm. You're not guaranteed to get them, but they do that. And they've also come out with, um, like, new chapters to the main sort of storyline um, that you can play through and get more orbs that way. Um, they've come out with new sort of, like, special maps um, that you can do. So very frequently there's some sort of, like, new content that you can play, new characters you can play with, and they'll also have events where, for example, you get uh, bonus experience for a couple of days or something like that. Hmm. Um, where, you know, I you, you sort of, you have enough to go on, kind of like with your, whatever your project is, as I like to call it for the time. I'm building up this character, and um, one of the big changes I've actually made, I'm not sure if I mentioned this um, last time I talked about it, you can actually inherit special skills uh, from other characters. So basically you burn that character to get one of their up to three of their skills on another character. Um, so when they first came out with the game, you would notice that any given character, there's an A slot, a B slot, and a C slot. Um, and each one kind of like has its own sort of like it's this type of ability, broadly speaking. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Would what you they say are. it's as easy as one, two, three? Uh, not quite, <laughs> but oh. sure. Uh, but Don't typically, no. any given oh. character would only have, say, an A and a C, or a B and a C, or an A and a B. Um, or what you can do now is if you have a character that you're not using who has a good C ability, 
and you've got a character with an A B, you can actually inherit that C skill from the other character and kind of build. You know, it kind of reminds me in a way of um, Awakening, trying to build kind of like your perfect character with all the right skills and stuff like that. That's kind of through the, through eugenics. <laughs> yeah, except not through eugenics this time. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> through through pure human sacrifice this time. <laughs> oh, oh, that's much better. That <laughs> makes it much better. Um, no. I, was getting, I was getting worried there for a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, that, but that's that's great though. I mean, that it, it's at least it's maintaining your interest. How long has it been out at this point? Uh oh, it's been a about while. A month and a half, maybe. No, or, or maybe not that long. But several months. Um, really, I forget exactly when it came out, but I think it might have been um, before this year, actually, like late last year. Really, I wow. have to look it up. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's been it's definitely been keeping my interest, and so kind of my my main time burners whenever whenever I happen to be on my phone are uh, Duolingo, trying to keep up my daily streak on that. And uh, playing Fire Emblem. Uh, Fire Emblem Heroes was released on February second. Okay, it was early this year, though. but it has been it has been out for what three months now? I guess so. Yeah. Um, and so, have you been interested in picking up um, Echoes, the new Fire Emblem game, instead of Heroes? I've been interested in picking it up, but I'm waiting mm. until I get through some other games. Well, first. it's kind of funny too, is the Heroes inspired me to get back into Fates um, because it's a different enough game. Like it's really solid, but it does also make you kind of like want to go back to like the full Fire Emblem See, experience. I've been reading a lot about um, Echoes, and mm-hmm. I would actually probably recommend picking that up yeah. instead. I'm, I'm planning sounds, to get it, yeah. mainly because mm-hmm. it's been it's being handled by a different. Um, Translation company mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that is doesn't have the same sort of issues that that Fates ran into. It's mm-hmm. it's it's more along the lines of Awakening in terms of the way that it was handled. Yeah, um, which is good because mm-hmm. I really like the way Awakening yeah. was translated. Didn't really appreciate Fates mm-hmm. much, so I like that they're going back. And plus, Echoes has some older mm-hmm. uh, style Fire Emblem gameplay. If you're used to the series mm-hmm. from before, Awakening kind of codified a lot of the elements. Right, um, yeah. Echoes is a, re- is a remake it's of... It's a remake of... The second or third game. Yeah. It was, it was a spin-off, Fire Emblem mm-hmm. Gaiden, as I recall. Right, right. And so, yeah, it's definitely on my list. I do want to grab it. I just wanted to finish out Fates because I never did finish it. Um, so Fates is what I'm sort of slowly working through right now, and then once that's done, I'll definitely pick up Echoes. Let's all go on a nostalgia trip to see what we can learn from games of the past. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, emulation and gaming uh, for the uh, the modern retro gamer. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been, for the past uh, several months, I have been pl- gaming on um, mostly a retro pie. Oh yeah, those are system. cool. Those yeah. are very cool. And uh, for those that don't know, uh, the retro pie itself is essentially... Um, well, it's it's sort of codifies a bunch of different um, emulators and, and systems like Emulation Station and uh, RetroArch mm-hmm. in order to play a whole bunch of different um, gaming systems. And it runs off of like a Raspberry Pi. It right? runs off a Raspberry Pi, and and to I'm using a Raspberry Pi uh, three so mm-hmm. that I can play even PlayStation One games on mm-hmm. it. And for those who don't know, what is the Raspberry Pi? Well, that's what I was. I'm glad you asked because mm-hmm. I actually pulled up the information, the specs. I'm not saying these off the top of my head, mm-hmm. um, but it's essentially a very small computer that's about the size of a deck of cards. Mm-hmm. Uh, playing cards, and um, it has a 1.2 gigahertz, 64-bit quad-core, quad-core ARM V8 CPU, mm. uh, and one gigabyte of RAM. But it has full HDMI support, and um, surprisingly, even though it's it's would seem to be underpowered, it's a very small computer that you can buy for about. Uh, was it like twenty five bucks? I think. It's yeah, I think. Cheap. I think the idea was that they wanted to have a computer that's really affordable that people in like third world countries, for example, could mm-hmm. get mm-hmm. affordably and start to learn how to code and start to use well, computers. It's a completely exactly. dedicated system. It though. is just just like a console, mm-hmm. which then they muddy up with OSs and, and well, things. Become. But a, a console is really a low powered computer that is completely dedicated, mm-hmm. and so it can do things that a equivalent computer couldn't. Yes, but this one specifically, you, you choose how you want to dedicate it. Right. And that's what the RetroPie um, front end is, is it allows you to, to to install a system through which you can run emulators on your Raspberry Pi And nothing Pi system. else. And nothing else. Right. Um, if you choose to do so. And some people have installed other things on the Raspberry Pi, such as Kodi, which is a... Um, Video streaming mm-hmm. service that people sometimes use, um, but honestly, it's so cheap. It's like what ten bucks for one of these things? Raspberry Pi? Yeah. No, it's more like twenty to twenty-five. Okay, well, um, still, and they have different models. But you're right; it is very cheap. Now you have to put it together yourself, right? What, it comes, that. it comes apart in pieces, mm-hmm. and you basically you're, you're building your computer, basically. Right. But it's of course a very small computer. With so tweezers. You, yeah, I mean it's it's pretty small. I mean it's it's. It doesn't take that long to set up, and then you have to install the system. But what I like about the Retro Pi that I find really neat is the way that, and really a lot of this is coming from the emulation station part of it, but 
it lets you manage a whole bunch of different game systems in with a you know a GUI that is approachable and accessible and uh, really easy to work with and installing a whole bunch of different types of controllers and setups and you know options such as um, using save states that you if you want or turbo modes mm-hmm. um, I recently also picked up an um, 8-bit dough as a, as a Hong Kong company that does recreations for controllers from various eras and uh, the one they came out with most recently is actually a recreation of the N64 controller they do mm-hmm. um, Bluetooth connections Bluetooth controllers basically and um, so you can play wirelessly the one that I bought was a recreation of the uh, Super Nintendo controller, mm. but I was very impressed with uh, just how authentic it is. Um, it comes with you know, the same sort of button setup. It has the dimpled buttons for the top two and the uh, the, con- the convex buttons for the other two. That's amazing. But instead of having those like mushy kind of buttons that you get with, because I've, I've actually tried a lot of different USB controllers, mm-hmm. looking for one that could could give me that retro feel when I want to play a game that's on, say, the, the, the Nintendo or the Super Nintendo systems, mm-hmm. um, this one really kind of scratches that itch because it is everything about it from the look, the color scheme, the feeling, um, the responsiveness of the D-pad and the Does it have a little click that when, I mean, whenever you, you really get into it, it's like it, it got that pushback and the click? Yeah, it feels, it feels accurate. Nice. Every, all the buttons feel very accurate. The weight feels... Um, pretty much the same, at least that I can remember. The the one big difference is there's no wire. It's yeah. all Bluetooth. Well, just remember you were a little smaller back then. Right. So, also, that's, that's true. <laughs> if it feels light, it's probably because you're a big, strong man now. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it definitely. Um, I've been eating my Wheaties. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but I, I will. I think I do think that uh, I do recommend picking one up. I don't think it is a replacement for playing on an actual um, console because there is a little bit of authenticity that you lose when it comes to um, if you were actually playing on the, the, the hardware itself, the original hardware. Right. Anytime you do hardware emul- emulation, not software emulation, software emulation can be pitch perfect mm-hmm. if you're playing on the original hardware. But hardware emulation, you do lose a little bit of authenticity. Um, not much because these systems, we, we've, we've pretty much perfected it at this point. It's about as good as you're going to get. But there's a little bit that's lost there. So I don't. I wouldn't say it's perfect, but it's great for playing games that are hard to find or that you don't own or that you're planning to pick up at some point, but you're not sure if it's really worth the money. Uh, so especially if you're going to play, for example, when I played Earthbound, this was maybe three months ago I talked about playing Earthbound. Mm-hmm. It's not that easy of a game to find, the U.S. version of Earthbound. So as opposed to actually going out and trying to find a game and pay a, you know 100 bucks for it, I'd much rather just... You know, find another version, a digital version, and play that, and see, hey, is it really worth me going out and spending that sort of money, or you know, getting it on like because you could play it on, say, like a virtual console system, but without the same sort of experience in terms of the controls, etc. Now, I assume, so, assume you're talking about ROMs here. I'm you, talking you about ROMs. Find, yeah. Now, we did an Old. episode a couple a uh, couple of weeks ago, I guess it was, that was about uh, ROM hacks. Yeah. And can you can you do that on on this too? If the if the ROM hacks are made to work um, on that system, yes. Oh, okay. That's the whole point. So yeah, if so it's they a ROM, have to be for it. Yeah, if it's a ROM, like for example, uh, the another Metroid Two remake. Yeah, yeah. Was not a ROM hack. It was a built from scratch yeah, it was game. A full game. So because of that, no, that that needs to have its own space. But sure. if it was a um, like I talked about um, Metroid Rogue Dawn, which was a ROM hack of the right. original Metroid, of course. And so I actually do have some ROM hacks on there, uh, several of them that I, that I have gone Neat. through. Um, ROM hacks of uh, Legend of Zelda, Zelda 2, Metroid, Mario. There's a ton of ROM hacks of Mario, mm-hmm. all the different different Mario games. Um, and I think it's a great way to explore that side of it on you know what emulates the console experience. Yeah. And for Jim's take on why it's okay to steal games, watch that episode. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I have a friend who got a retro buy at one point uh, fairly recently, I think for Christmas. Mm. And, um, you know, like the first time he had it set up, he sort of hooked it up to his TV. And so it's basically like having eight retro consoles in one, essentially. Right. And we're able to, like, you know, hand out the controllers. And, like, you know, we were playing an old Sega Genesis game we used to play. And then we switched over to Super Nintendo and played a little bit of that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So it's a really neat little thing. Like the retro pie, when you plug it into the TV, it's almost like having a little a little mini console for retro games. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for that price, I mean, you could honestly go out and buy seven of them instead of a Switch. <laughs> I mean, really, because it's, it's extremely affordable. Yeah. That's cool. You educated me today. I don't hear that all the time. Yeah. 
This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. So I just want to real fast talk about the Sea Eternal. Uh, now this is interactive fiction in a way. Uh, you might call it... Uh, Oh, what, what, what do you what do you call it, Jim? Whenever there's uh, it's it's like an interactive novel or a uh, you know, video game novel. What do you call those things? Graphic novel. Visual novel. Visual novel. That's the term I'm looking for. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it that. It's not that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, but <laughs> glad I can help. <laughs> the Sea Eternal is an epic interactive fantasy novel by Linnea Glasser. Now I'm, I'm reading this off of ChoiceOfGames.com, so you can go check out these things there. Um, now, now, she's the one who did uh, Creatures Such as We, uh, which we talked about. We've talked about on the show. And uh, Color Atura, which I, I know nothing about. I haven't looked at that one. Um, but apparently that one won some awards and that sort of thing. Um, but what, I, what really compelled me about this one, this is um, – it's about mermen and, and mermaids. It's in the enchanted underwater a- city Apple of – Merman? No. Different, oh. mer- different mermen. Okay. Um, nobody's going to get that joke. No, nobody. Nobody at all. Um, in the underwater city of glass, what will you sacrifice for immortality? Love? Memories? Freedom? Will you take freedom from others to win your heart's desire? Dive into a world of mermaids, mermen, and other merfolk where every character has secrets and nothing is what it seems. And we talk a lot about on, on the show about uh, narrative choices and making them meaningful and that kind of a thing. Mm. And, and, you know, we kind of uh, we railed on that a little bit last week. Um, with this idea of meaningful choices and um, and content, but what what I like about this, we're not talking about uh, a graphically rich interface. We're not talking about a video game in, in the traditional sense. It's just a it's a story, but it's also kind of a choose your own adventure. But it's deeper than that. Um, if you study choose your own adventures, the old text oh, yeah. ones, you know that there's there's Sometimes it's like maybe 23 actual choices in these books. Yes. Um, you know, it's, the, the worst ones have like 13. Uh, the later ones actually, they, they got worse. The early ones were the ones that had more choices. Uh, and, and what I like about this is this is somebody who understands, Glasser understands that this is going to be done on your phone. It's written for your phone. And you've got a page, maybe, maybe a page and a half, maybe two pages before you make a decision or at least go on to the next page. And so because of that, you're not checking ahead to see, um, wait, how many, how many pages do I have to read before I make a decision? You feel like you're drawn through it in a meaningful way. Now, what I really liked about my experience of it was that even, say, an hour or so into the Sea Eternal, um, I had a rating of an independence versus respectability within my community of Merman. Mm. Um, I was... 39% bold. I was 73% independent, only uh, 61% patient, right? And my um, mortality was safely immortal once again. So, like I said, I was about an hour in when I took the this, this screenshot that, that all these things. Um, but then the characters I'd met, like Araya trusts you, Estre trusts you, or at least has no reason not to, Flynn seems inclined to trust you. And so there was a sort of meta element to it. Now, there are achievements and other things, too, which I don't, I don't really play for achieves. I never have. But ultimately, there, there's this mechanic element, this fundamental um, gameplay mechanic element to the story that is, goes deeper and more beyond this um, turn to page this, turn to page that. It's literally these characters are reacting to my stat. So if, if they trust me, I'm going to get a different page. Hmm. Than I would otherwise, and in that sense, it's like a it's like a role playing game, um, even though it's a, a closed system, completely closed system that I can game and uh, gamify. <laughs> it's still different than any other type of interactive fiction um, out there, and 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 I just really like that particular series. Um, so give it a you know give it a go if you will. Cool, interesting. Mm-hmm. See eternal. See eternal. This week's meaty topic of discussion. All right, so I guess we're going to move on into our meaty topic for the day. Um, And this time we're going to talk about um, forgiving poor design decisions. It is time. Or should we? To stop forgiving poor game design decisions. 
Hold grudges. Yes. <laughs> Hold grudges. Yes. We okay. need to, we need to have protests and uh, sit-ins. Uh, okay. I, I think game designers expect us to actually be sitting in, but that, that's irrelevant. Well, so I, I think really what we'll, what we're kind of what we're talking about here are where are game designers focusing their their attention and, and their money and um, their resources, and are they focusing it on the right? elements of a game, the right aspects of a game in order well to provide a good gaming experience. Well said. I, I also want to, before we start ragging on anybody, point out that we have a lot of respect for indie game devs. Especially whenever it's a small team doing uh, you know, small team stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I think, I think we can make a special mm, let's call it pass for games that are experimental, games that are trying new things, games that have made, uh, you know, the, the developers have made choices because of their uh, particular limitations and, and whatever. Really who I'm picking on here are these major title games, and I don't just mean title games, uh, but you know, AAA titles mm. that come out, like, oh, Horizon Zero Dawn, for example, um, big, huge windfall, and then there's just these things that fall short. Mm-hmm. Um, something that has to be patched almost immediately, like... Like Prey. That I like talked Prey, about last we were talking about last week. Yeah, great example. Um, it's not just about... I don't think it's... I think those are two different issues if we're talking about um, bugs, like releasing too early. Mm-hmm. So I'd rather focus more on intentional, like design choices. Right. Intentional choices. Yeah. Um, well, I think both of those relate in that we're talking about you did not sufficiently play test your game enough. Either you were pushed to release too early oh, that's or, true. or something like that. I mean, like that's, that. that's, certainly, that's certainly an element of it. And I think something that I've noticed, I'll give you a, a, a specific example from Prey to, to kind of mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. guide this discussion a little bit. Um, Prey is very much a game about... You're in. You're you're almost in a sandbox environment, and, you're, and there's a lot of um, elements in the environment and things in the environment that you can interact with in order to um, affect the outcome of, of an encounter with sure. an enemy. So um, you can use these hazards and use these these things in your environment in all sorts of different cool ways. The problem is that once you kind of learn the te- the right techniques or the, the techniques that work, I should say, mm-hmm. you're very strongly encouraged to keep doing the same thing over and over again and not experiment and I don't believe the design, the uh, developers wanted you to not experiment, but but you're encouraged to because the load times when you die are so long mm-hmm. in this game that, and I'm playing on console to be fair, yeah. But I'm talking about load times that are you know anywhere from 30 seconds to a full minute, and that's just unacceptable mm-hmm. in, yeah. in 2017 to, to for a AAA game to sit there and make you wait that long. Now I might try something once, maybe. If I'm feeling like I want to wait, if I if I fail, but but you get to a point where okay, I just want to get past this objective. I don't want to sit here and try something that might be cool if it works, but if it fails, I got to reload over and yeah. over and over. Especially if it's risky. I don't want to experiment. Yeah, and and but I should want to experiment. The whole point of this game is to experiment. Yeah, exactly. So I, I feel a little stymied by by these load times, and that was a decision by by the developer to put um, more focus on high resolution textures. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, draw distance and other and elements of the game where it's like uh, the graph, the the, the graphic um, look better, mm-hmm. and the game looks better, and it seems like it runs pretty well. But in order to do that, it has to load so much information that every time you you die and you has to reload that you know environment, it's going to take more time. Yeah. So you need to understand the hardware you're making it for. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because on PC, a lot of times you have load times that are much much quicker than the same game on oh, yeah. console. But, but only if you have a PC that's strong enough to handle it. Oh, people, that, people that have a, a PC that is, you know, maybe a few years out of date are still going to struggle. Yeah. It's just the people that have the, the super gaming rigs, and you can't develop your game around specific, that. Niche. Yeah, specifically yeah. around super gaming rigs. Mm-hmm. That's silly. Like a, a really good example, actually, is uh, Blizzard with Overwatch. They designed that game so that it has a lot of settings that. Like it, it's it's not like the most graphically intense game, but if you've seen it on Ultra, you can actually see that it's got like really great lighting effects and really awesome textures and actually higher poly models and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But you can also switch it down to the lower levels where like you know you still need a decent rig to run it, but like you know I can run that game on my PC, which can't handle PS4 era stuff. 
Right. Uh, but I can run Overwatch just fine. And if I'm willing to take a little bit more, like I'm, I'm sort of like in the middle graphically, if I went down to low, I could run it super well. Mm-hmm. If right. I was willing to have that lack of fidelity. Blizzard's pretty smart about that. Mm-hmm. When they developed um, World of Warcraft, they kind of had that in mind from the start. The game was set up to um, take advantage of people with weaker systems. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. they, they tried to optimize um, that experience, to optimize the game as much as they could so that you could play on a low-end system and not experience not experience lag from, now, maybe from your internet connection you might if it was bad, mm-hmm. but you're not going to experience, a fr- you know, crippling frame rate issues to the point that you can't play. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, they, they took that into account, but a lot of these modern AAA gaming experiences um, don't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they just don't, and I, I do feel that that's something that is... Something that we shouldn't forgive, like Doc's saying. I mean, we have to start holding some of these uh, developers to account. Yeah. And you have some other examples of this, too, I think, Doc, that you well, mentioned. you know, I mentioned Horizon, um, and, and there were a couple of patches that came out and fixed some things. They were all pretty minor. Um, but what, on day one, sort, sort of launch day, uh, was immediately apparent from, from videos, from complaints, from other things, is that there were two versions of the game sort of packaged on the same disc, and they were for the two versions of the PS4. And if you had a really good TV and you had the upgraded version of the PS4, you could play in the super high res. Uh, now, I've seen the super high res. It's not that different. It's nice, but it, it doesn't excuse some of the lag that people are complaining about. Yeah. And people are only complaining about the lag in the high res version with the faster system. That's a disconnect. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems almost like well, not almost like this is what they're doing. They're trying to make the screenshots look as perfect as they can, as exactly beautiful what they're doing. as they can, so they can sell the. So they feel like that helps them sell the game, and I think to an extent it probably does. Well, I'm sure it did, but that does a disservice to the community and gamers when they actually play these games because once it's in motion, like you're saying, you don't really notice that difference because it is a, it is a subtle difference between those two versions. And there are some games, and like it's going to be happening now more that the the four. Um, the PS4 Pro is available. Uh, people are going to be developing games to have like 4K mode or sped up uh, 1080 mode. Right. Um, where like you're still playing in 1080p, but now it's at 60 frames per second. Whereas if you're doing 4K, it's only at 30. Right. That sort of thing. Which is horrible. Why would you? You should want. You need to play at the higher frame rate. That's going to give you the better gaming experience. You're not. It's just because it looks slightly better. Why would you want to play at 30 FPS just so that it looks a little bit better? I don't, I don't understand. Like, well, I mean, I, I can see like if it's if it's still a good solid like non laggy thirty. I'm actually used to thirty, and so I'm actually really cool with like having my screen look clearer rather than having something that looks fuzzier. But you're not. Faster. I don't think you're going to really notice it that much when you're actually in the game, unless the game itself is like a something like Mist. Or mm-hmm. something where it's mm-hmm. just like a lot of still shots or a um, explore the environment type game, you're not going to notice that if you're actually in an action situation. Yeah, if you walk really close to a leaf on a tree, right, and you sort of you know break the immersion to get that leaf as close to the screen as you can, you can tell the difference. But why? Yeah. Well, and and part of it is okay. So we all know that we're playing a video game. You're not tricking us. Well, sure. We know it's a game. And this, this, this desire to, well, let's try to make it look as realistic as possible. Um, why? I mean, you're, you're, let's, let's make, make it look as the way that you need the game to look based on the story that you're trying to tell and the experience that you're trying to give to the player. Yeah. But don't go so overboard that you kind of you give them a, a worse experience. Well, what I'm hearing you say is gameplay first. And yes. what we've, we've talked Gameplay about before first. is Nintendo's approach, where for the last several consoles, they've been the less powerful machine. That's right. And yet they still are able to succeed and put out really great games because they'll make stylistic choices graphically that make right. the game still look good without having to be as hardware intensive. That's right. So a, a way that I've said this before, and actually I, I stole this from Tim Schafer, is let your limitations become opportunities. And that's important. Um, as, as a design philosophy, I think that's important. Be, because he said that, um, it, was, it was way back in the day, he said this, oh my gosh, it's been like 10 years ago. Um, but he was talking about Psychonauts when he said it. Mm-hmm. And what he was specifically talking about was the graphical limitations of the day, um, of that system and you know the problems that came along with it. Um, 
And he basically chose to make the whole thing a cartoon and look like a cartoon and embrace big heads and that sort of a thing. And, and when we think about all those older games, retro games, take a look at Mario, actual Mario. Why does Mario have such a massive head? Is it because they weren't worried about you know, him being anatomically correct? Or was it because they were going for a cartoon? Or was it? No, it's because they, he, he made the, the face first. Mm-hmm. It's not Tim Schafer I'm talking about, you know, Miyamoto at this point. You, you're talking about you know, Super Mario Brothers or Super Mario Brothers. Donkey Kong. Yes. Yeah, what is the most distinguishing right. feature of Mario? It's his mustache, mm-hmm. yeah. it's his hat, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's that, that jumpsuit. Mm-hmm. And we, that was in just a couple of pixels. You know, it was like a 16 by 16 pixel frame. That, that's super important. And, and I, th- I don't think we think in that frame of mind <laughs> anymore. Uh, and I'm not saying that, that we should go back to you know, 16-bit graphics. That's, that's not what I'm saying at all. I actually don't really enjoy um, you know, bit graphics at all, not, not like you, Jim, um, in that sense. Um, and we, I loved our retro episode where we talked about that. Uh, when we were talking about you know, the, the right and the wrong way to, to do old-looking graphics. But mm-hmm. that's not my point at all. My, my, my point really has more to do with uh, these these design decisions that actually hurt the gameplay. We're forty to sixty years into video games, depending on where you start the clock. We're well past the um, black and white era of television. We're well past you know the experimental phase of the movie industry. We are solidly into knowing what we're doing from a design perspective. We should take the hardware we have, we should take the the software that we have, we should take the engines that we have, we should take the techniques that we have, and we should design with those in mind. I agree. That's my argument. I mean, I think I would say where we are right now, um, we're getting close to or possibly are in the the, uh, beginnings of like the auteur era from film where Mm -hmm. we have these very strong um, voices from designers that you can see right. their, their, their fingerprints and their touch all over games and uh, people that are uh, given given the, the this is authorship similar to a director might be for a film. Yeah, and we had a whole episode right. on and that. And we had an idea to talk yeah. about that yeah. too. So I think that's kind of the era that we're in where but we also have a lot of big studios that are just trying to pump out um, you know, basic experiences based on other other styles of games because th- that makes a lot of money. There's, there's, that's okay too mm-hmm. if you want to try to make an optimized experience based on what we already know. But if you do that, you need to make sure that you're focusing on the right things. Mm-hmm. And I think, and I think that the gameplay has to be paramount. I mean, that's yeah. there, there's too much of a focus on let's make it look nice in a screenshot mm-hmm. or on a trailer mm-hmm. without actually okay, how's it actually going to run? Um, but even if you make a game that that a lot of people buy, um, if they don't have a good time, they don't have a good experience, that's going to sour them on maybe buying the sequel or buying an expansion or buying another game uh, from the same company. Mm-hmm. And you definitely want things to look nice. You know, like you, the it, two games being equal in gameplay, if the one looks terrible and one looks really awesome, you're probably going to be more attracted to the one that looks really awesome, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Assuming that but, the, there's... But it looks, but looks good, too. I mean, that's... And, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean... More realistic yeah. doesn't mean like higher resolution textures yeah. necessarily. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Necessarily, you yeah. can you can like Doc was saying, you can work within your mm-hmm. limitations. Yeah, and to still make it look good regardless of, of technical specs. Yeah. Well, it's not just about looking good though. Mm-hmm. It, it's about the full package of the experience, mm-hmm. right? And I think that like there's definitely some value in trying to like sort of push the limits and innovate and get better. You look, for example, um, at the the PS3 when it first came out, or the Xbox 360, that kind of era, um, when we sort of took the I think the last major leap we've had in graphical quality. Um, because you know you could argue that what we have on like you know PS4 Xbox One era is just a refinement of what happened in PS3. Oh, I completely agree. And you know the beginning of that generation looked very different from the end because we got much much better at optimizing, sure, and, and you, making things look good with the hardware we had. And you can see um, that actually on pretty much every system. Mm-hmm. You go all the way back and you look at like the very first game that you might see on even like the, the NES mm-hmm. versus the last few games you saw. Yeah. Yeah. Very different in terms of like how they were using their those graphical limitations mm-hmm. to the maximum they possibly yeah, could. Exactly. And I remember when the PS3 first came out, and I think it's even more valid now given how little of a jump there was. I mean yeah. there there is a jump between PS3 and PS4, but compared to two two to three, it's a it's a less noticeable one. But I was always kind of under the impression or my my sort of thought on it was that I'd rather have 
kind of if you sort of look at PC as being the thing outside of the console generations, where like you're probably going to upgrade your PC more frequently than consoles will upgrade. Um, like sort of taking the graphics basically that we had on PS2 and taking the hardware of the PS3 is almost as if we're just upgrading our PC to run the same game better. So an example of this actually is um, Borderlands 2 when I got my then new PC and it's not a it's not a gaming rig but it was definitely more powerful than like you know the the last generation was. I was able to take Borderlands 2 which ran you know pretty well ish on the PS3 for example and then play it on basically the ultra settings on my PC. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have like the ability to have longer draw distances, more detail, more particles, um, better textures potentially. But the graphics essentially are the same, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so what I kind of wanted when the PS3 first came out was to keep the PS2's graphics, but then just make them better. But what we did instead is try to focus on... Make the games better, you mean? Overall. Well, the, the the games could be helped by this. They mm-hmm. could have like a grander scale, for example. You could have like more things happening on screen with less lag. But you know, basically, it's just as far as the way it looks. It would basically look like a PS2 game sure. turned up to eleven rather than a. PS3 let's game. let's fix the screen tearing before we try to. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'm well, with you. It's, that's something that um, I know there there is a community within within gamers that that love to talk about the. The, the higher graphical fidelity versus the higher FPS, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, and that the the better experience that you're going to get with a higher FPS game, with a, a game running at, say, 60 FPS, whenever you hear about a game that's, at least in the circles that I, that I run and mm-hmm, for my hearing mm-hmm. a lot of these uh, game forms, if a game comes out and it's only going to run at 30 FPS, mm-hmm. there's a kind of a collective sigh from, from the community of... Well, what the heck? We're, this is 2017. Why are we having a game come out that's, that's running at 30 FPS? Well, it's because of obviously the graphics, the mm-hmm. textures are too are too good. The, the the lighting effects we're using are too good. They're they're focusing on on these other elements to the point where the game, the the system that it is on, literally cannot run it at 60 FPS. Yeah. It has to run yeah. it at 30 FPS um, because of the way they want the game to look. And I do think certain games do benefit from you know really pushing a limit on textures, really pushing a limit on graphics. Um, certain games, like if you're talking about, say, a survival horror experience. Sure, yeah. You, it's going to be really slow, really, you know, a, a methodical approach. You're not going to be running around super quickly. Oh, load and trying times to shoot can things. kill a horror game. Sure, that's also true. Yeah. But but I do think that there is, I'll take a little bit more of a focus there on, on the visuals, in my opinion. I, I think you can do that. But if you're talking about an action game... An act, like not even an action adventure, an action game where you're going to be moving very quickly all the mm-hmm. time. You want to have higher frames mm-hmm. per second. That you don't. Sense. You don't need to worry about the perfect textures on a wall because yeah. you're going to be moving so quickly. You're not going to be focusing on but it. But if you're tiptoeing through a, a hallway and there's goo on the floor and you're like, oh, what is that creepy stuff? You want to be able to see it exactly. So, so I'm not saying that graphics are bad or that you shouldn't focus on graphics. Mm-hmm. You have to know the game, and we've said this before. Make know the game. The ga- you're or, or, know the game that you're going to make and make the game that you. Need to play. Another Whatever. I don't even remember what we were going to. Same speech, actually. Thank you. Yes, but no, but it, but it's, these are these are true statements. I mean, yeah, these, these are. are kind of truisms that that you know he picked up from playing games himself, That's obviously, right. and then That's sort right. of applied those philosophies and then explained them, sort of put them into words. Mm-hmm. Um, things that were already being kind of used by earlier earlier designers. An interesting trend I noticed too, and I'm, I'm sure we could find exceptions on both sides if we really thought about it. Of but course. As a general trend, what, at least the games that I've been playing, I tend to notice like Western games tend to focus more on fidelity at the cost of frame rate, um, as opposed to say like Japanese games. Um, two big examples that we've talked about a lot recently, Nier and Persona 5, yeah. are both very stylized, but they both have very high frame rates. And you can see, like, if you really look closely at the art style, they have a lot of very low-poly things, mm-hmm. um, low-resolution textures. Nier does especially. Um, kind of like, you know, mm-hmm. simple simple shapes, simple and things, but they're able to... It makes it work. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, 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 know what they're, they know what they're trying to do, mm-hmm. and they're able to present what is still... A visually impressive yeah. experience. Yeah, it's it's like it's one of those things where they tend to focus on the things you're actually looking at, and this this happens in other games too. I'm not saying it's only Japanese developers who do this, but they put a lot of fidelity into the things you're actually paying attention to, and less on the things that are just supposed to be background. And so you'll notice, for example, going through an environment in Persona Five, where you've got lots of very simple shapes off in the distance, but because they're using all the very simple shapes and sort of simplified stuff. They're able to have these big, sweeping environments that look really cool. Um, same thing with Nier. You're able to have these massive, massive fights going on. But, you know, all the buildings are very square and very mm-hmm. low poly, that sort of thing. Yeah, and I think I think Nier, um, um, Nier is a good example because 
you you fight you have to fight sometimes um, lots of enemies are on screen at one at one time. They might have lots of bullets on screen at one time. There's a ton of particle effects. Mm-hmm. There's so much going on at once that if you are you wouldn't be able to do it with 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 higher res graphics. I think. I mean, the game does look great, but you're right. When it comes to buildings, they they intentionally make them uh, more geometric. Uh, they use lower lower textures for you know th- than you might expect on say a PS4 game. Um, for you know, the wall of a building, like the brick of a building or something, they're not going to they're not going to try to kill themselves to make that look perfect. Whereas well, some games do. Mm-hmm. I mean, some games today are doing that, mm-hmm. are focusing on mm-hmm. that. And it, should should they really be? I mean, if you're doing an action game, no, you shouldn't. I mean, mm-hmm. you you don't want you kill your action game, you kill your experience mm-hmm. if you do that. Yeah, there's a whole other way to look at this too, mm-hmm. uh, and that's through the lens of the adventure game, mm-hmm. um, the, the sort of golden age of the classic adventure game, um, sort of the the Lucas Arts era, if you will. Um, a lot of those games are being remade and re-released now. Um, for oh, yeah, like yeah. Monkey Island. M- yeah, Monkey Island was uh, was an H- HD remake. Didn't they recently remake Full Throttle. They just did. It's, yeah. it's wonderful. I was thinking of picking that up actually. Uh, you, you, I never played you the original. Oh, you told it was one of my favorite games. Uh, I played it on my 486 back in the day, man. All, all my all-in-one compact <laughs> and, until the green smoke came out of it. And <laughs> then, then <laughs> the magic green smoke comes out of your computer. You're done. But. Um, yeah, it, great stuff. Grim Fandango's had a, a facelift, some of these others. Yet there are a few and 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 I'm not really I'm not picking on anybody when I say this at all. Um there are a few indie developers who are now embracing this idea and going back and looking and making in this style like uh Thimbleweed Park just came out and it's done in that style. Um, and it's got enough callbacks you feel like it's this sort of lost Lucas Arts gem, but at the same time it's got a few modern uh, tie-ins that make it really you know and updates that that you you recognize. Okay, this is obviously a current game, brilliant game, but it's got that same sort of let's call it problem that all adventure games have, which is uh, you run through it once, you won't be able to play it again uh, while you remember what what it is you're to do. But if you refrain from looking up the answer and you actually challenge your brain to figuring out what to do next, um, you can have a lot of fun with these types of games. But it's certainly not graphically intense. And it's certainly not about frame rates. Mm -hmm. You've got a pixelated character who's walking around on the screen and you've got great audio and and it's written well and all of these things. But it's a completely different approach within the context of what used to be a problem and no longer is. My fear, and this is where I'm going with all this, my fear is this. Let's skip ahead 10 years from now. Uh, Call it a gaming generation, a Mm. console generation, if you will, right? We're into the the ninth generation of consoles, and suddenly this this frame rate versus graphics argument isn't even an issue anymore. We can handle anything, Mm -hmm. right? Um, it, It beams lasers into your eyes, so it's all a simulation anyway. It doesn't matter, right? Have we forgotten how to design games? Have we forgotten how to tell stories? Have we forgotten what it is that we, we made these games to do in the beginning? Mm. You know, it, look at interactive fiction. Where is it? Oh, well, that's text. I don't want to just sit around and read text. I'll go read a book if I want to do that, except I'm not going to read a book either, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's, to me, uh, it's this sort of lost and, and sort of dying art of, of this wonderful, beautiful opportunity because it is... To, to, to twist my own words here, it's no longer a challenge. It's no longer a uh, limitation, right? So because it's not a limitation, we don't challenge ourselves against the, as, as an opportunity. Mm. You see what I'm saying? I mean, I, I do see what you're saying. And I think that there's, there's a fear of that sort of complacency and not really having a challenging experience and just kind of going along with um, whatever we think is like the perfect way to make something or mm-hmm. like just having these, you know, by the numbers design that a lot of games are already, the trap a lot of games are already falling into, I think is maybe what you're, the direction that you think it, it might be going. Well, kind of, sort of, yeah. Um, but, I, but I do think that there are, um, there's still experimentation going on. Um, a lot of it is, some of it is coming from the um, indie space. Some of it, I some would of say, it, because, all of it. because clearly plenty of the indies are also doing mm-hmm. uh, straight up trying to revamp older games mm-hmm. and trying to take, you know, so there's plenty of non-experimentation in these space too. I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to like talk them up too much, but there is also experimentation there. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and then there's also some experimentation in from some of these gaming auteurs that, that you know we, we talked right. about. People like uh, uh, Yo- Yoko Taro that I that develops near um, has a lot takes us a lot of experimentation in that game. We got Puyo Puyo Tetris now, sure. Jim. Well, <laughs> I'm just saying for um, for good or ill. That's not experimentation. I don't know. What it is. <laughs> yes, uh, but there's, <laughs> there, there, that exists, and I think it always will exist as long as there are. As long as there are producers, as long as there are companies that are willing to, to, to fund those experiences, mm-hmm. as, alongside the um, Call of Duties and the Maddens, the mm-hmm. games that they know are going to make tons of money. And it's like the um, – and we'll get a little off topic here, but it's like in the film industry where we have tons of, of really honestly predictable and boring films that might – that might be interesting, or well, not interesting, they might be um, entertaining the first time you see it. Mm-hmm. But it's like cotton candy. You eat it, you enjoy it, and then like you forget that you ever even had it, you know, right after you're done. Sure, right yeah. after you walk out of the theater, you're done. It's like, oh, okay. It's like you, you, go, you go watch Avengers, so you're like, oh, yay, this is fun. And then you walk out of the theater and you go, wait, okay, what was that? What was that movie about? I don't even know. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's, it was, it's just, there's no, there's no substance. Sequence there. of YouTube clips is what and, it was. Right. You know, there's no and, substance. Interestingly, this ties in a little bit with uh, some stuff they mentioned, Hitmakers, that book I mentioned last week. Yes. Where um, a lot of times the reason that all these movies are kind of unremarkable is because people are playing it safe. They're going yes. with the things that they sort of know will work. They're not taking too many risks, that sort mm-hmm. of thing. And that's what I'm saying, mm-hmm. that, that a lot of game designers are doing, uh, uh, game developers, I should say, yes. are doing as well. So, but even though that's happening, like in the film industry, they're, even though they're getting a lot of their money from those movies because, let's face it, the masses will, will, will spend money on those movies. They'll, right. they'll buy the tickets, but they'll also still fund that, you know, weird indie indie director that wants to try something different or that weird yeah. movie idea and they fund it because they want to get that recognition as like I'm sure. a studio that supported this weird idea or this new cool idea or this like different take on something and that's what we that's what we need to support so for mm-hmm. every um, you know Square Enix funds all of these big games that are that are kind of playing it safe but then they also go okay we're gonna we're gonna throw some money to this you know, Yoko Taro to, to um, make make near even though it's such a weird experience, it's going to try all these different things. We'll just let him do whatever he wants because sure. we don't have to give him that much money because it's, it doesn't require that much money for him to make what he's going to make. We're not expecting to get a huge return on it. I mean, it did get a huge return mm-hmm. unexpectedly, and they've said this, but they're not expecting that. They're expecting to get attention as like, hey, look, we're supporting people mm-hmm. and weird ideas. Yeah. Look at what, look at what we're supporting. Yeah. They get a little bit of goodwill. Yeah. And so as long as the, the game – Industry is willing to do that, and unfortunately, I do see that occurring a little bit more in, in the um, foreign space than I do here in America. Mm-hmm. Right. Quite honestly, yeah. But both Nintendo and Sony have like you know sort of indie programs where they'll either um, you know publish an indie game or they'll like, right. you know make their platform mm-hmm. more accessible mm-hmm. to indie developers, that sort of thing. Yeah, and these these mega companies with these making these mega games, they have mega teams as well. Four hundred people on a game is right. completely normal, so that we can push it out. And what that means is there's no single person's responsibility. I mean, you can climb the hierarchy, but mm-hmm. um, no single person's responsibility to, to fix all the things. Um, but I'm going to point out Horizon Zero Dawn again for one very specific reason. It's because of what you said. Mm-hmm. Um, they took a lot of risks. Mm-hmm. That, the whole mechanical dinosaur thing and the post-apo- post-post-apocalypse and a lot of that stuff, um, some of the ideas with the narrative, all that really, really well done. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. They constructed different cultures. They did all these things very, very well. And then I, I, this is my opinion, but I think they got to a point where they were like, oh, but this is a video game. Mm-hmm. And that, that clause, but this is a video game, I think potentially has ruined the game. Because when you do get to, it's called Meridian, it's the big town, you've got all these vendors, and it's like, okay, yeah, you could go and you could you could kill a thing, which is the core mechanic of this game, or you can buy it from this guy right here. Mm-hmm. Um, and Oh, and by the way, um, all the weapons, all the vendors have all the weapons. Oh, and um, this thing over here, this Easter egg that you're going to get, whenever you get that, you're going to get a chest inside of that as a random thing. Mm-hmm. So make sure that you go collect all the things. Oh, but by the time you level high enough to get to the places that you need to be in order to collect all the things, mm-hmm. you're going to already have gear that's better mm-hmm. than what you're going to get from the random pull from the thing. Mm-hmm. And I think that this is starting to veer into a topic that deserves its whole own discussion. I agree. Because I remember another thing you mentioned before we started recording today was um, you know the idea of like you have this really cool 
immersive game where you're out hunting these robot dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. Um, but then all of a sudden, oh, my health's low. I'm going to go go gather an herb and then eat that herb to fill up my health instantly. Right. Um, that sort of deal, which... Those are conceits, and, and we yeah. can excuse them. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know, are there certain conceits, certain conventions that maybe we don't need to keep going back to? Yeah. Um, are there times that we should be more experimental rather I'm, than falling back on the tried and true? Exactly. And had had Horizon Zero Dawn taken more risk and not played it safe ultimately in the end, I think it would have been a stronger game. It would have been a harder game. It would have been a more a compelling game in many, many ways. But it would have felt less like a video game in that regard, which I think would have been good. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I do think that there – and there, there's – a lot of, like you said, there's a lot of risk there, and there's a lot of danger of yeah. the game not being a success when they do that. But I do think that if you look at something, I, I do think that near, um, near Automata kind of show that those sort of games can be successful. And you might see this a little bit. That was an you, experimental game, right? When you play the demo, you might see a little bit of that. I, I, I still want to loan you the game once I get it back from the other friend that I, I look forward to. to it. Um, but you'll you'll see very quickly that it kind of ignores some of these conventions that we have in video games where it's oh um this is how i'm supposed to do this thing and i've learned how to do this thing and i know i know the language of the game now okay now i know how to approach different problems i'm just going to have different problems and, and they're going to be challenging me but i'm going to be using the same language no yeah no you're going to it's going to keep switching up on you and that's a huge risk and that's like the, uh-huh. an experience that you know frustrated a lot of players and it's not a game for everyone but it's that is also what makes it a very interesting game, and yeah. I watch a lot of a lot of um, uh, foreign films and, and some indie films, and, I, and that's sort of what I'm looking for in that experience is something different and something unique. Yeah. And even if I'm watching it and I get to the end and I go, "Well, you know, that wasn't really that enjoyable of a movie," mm-hmm. but you know, it tried some different things. It did some. It took some interesting, um, played with some interesting concepts, and tried some new techniques. Um, I feel like you know, I was I had a it, it challenged me in some way, and therefore it was a worthy uh, use of, say, 90 minutes. So I, that's what video games kind of have to get into. I know there's more buy-in than 90 minutes, and that's yeah. another part of it too. Yeah. But that that should allow if, – if we approach video game design in that way in the future – you know, there's who knows where we could go. That's absolutely true. Well, you know, last week, um, Chris, you talked about the makers and, mm-hmm. and that, that balance between the convention and the new. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really what we're talking about here. So I, I agree. I think we should have a, uh, a second part to this discussion, the forgiving poor game design decisions, where we talk about the difference between um, what conventions, what video game conventions can we forgive mm-hmm. versus where do we need to have new innovation, um, whether that be out of our limitations or not. And, and what sort of games should be experimental and which one shouldn't be? Exactly. I mean, if you're trying to make a, if you're if you're making NBA 2K and you're trying to make the the player feel like they're playing in the NBA, you can only experiment so far. That's right. And if you're making a new Mario, you can only experiment too, so far with with the mechanics before it stops being Mario. Well, then, it can or, become, or even Tetris for that matter. Well, then it can become Mario Kart or Mario Tennis. Or, well, you know, <laughs> but that's that's using yeah. the character in a different, completely different type right, of game. Right, yeah. I, I'm literally talking about the, the core Mario properties. Right, right. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you but even you there, go to Paper Mario and you've got RPG elements, yeah. but still, it's Mario, mm-hmm. right? But even there, though, if you look at if you look at the original Super Mario Brothers and you compare it to something like Super Mario Galaxy or Sunshine, yeah. Because it went 3D and, and uh, but it's, important but it's, changes. But it's very different, is my point. In right, terms it is. Of, so, so there was still a lot of experimentation there, even between, say, Mario Galaxy and Mario 64. I agree. I agree with that. Or Mario Sunshine. But oh. still we're talking about, you know, Mario. You, you don't have the, the, the serious Mario who actually goes and, 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 and as a plumber, he... he you know, he fixes plumbing, and then he goes out into space and, and has a rocket fighter or well, something. That would be just weird. You're, you're, you're thinking of story story um, changes, and I'm t- I'm focusing more on game mechanics. Mechanics, yeah, that's, that's fair. I guess I guess that's fair. You're right, though. The story should, but the story shouldn't change really. I mean, it, it's no, Mario. No, it's it Mario. Be the it's the Mario hook, which is the, go go save the princess. You know, that's at, at its core. Every six year old understands that, and we we tap our inner six year old whenever we play Mario. I, I really think. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was 12 when I first played a, a Nintendo, but 
and I was still tapping my inner six year old, my idealistic <laughs> inner six year old, if you will. But yeah, so sort of like bringing this back full circle to um, the hardware issues and the mm-hmm, optimization mm-hmm. issues. I think that the same thing that applies to design and sort of like having that right mix of the familiar and the new comes down to how we approach dealing with hardware too, where you need to keep pushing your limits while also keeping the quality of the product in mind. You know, taking. Yeah. Using using the hardware for what it's able to do, and you know maybe experimenting here and there to make it better, but not at the cost of the experience of the gameplay. If that makes well sense. Said. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think that's I think we're all kind of saying the same thing. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm on the same page with you completely. This is probably our most agreeable <laughs> roundtable that we've had. In You're a while. wrong. This is not our most agreeable. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Then oh, okay. we got close. But yeah, if any of you listeners out there have any thoughts on this as well, we'd love to hear from you. Feel feel free to write into inbox and uh, you know let us know if there are any uh, games out there that you think do a good job of this or don't, or uh, developers that you think have done a good job of this or haven't. It's a very complicated topic, and I think there are a lot of points that we haven't even touched on. Um, yeah, like mobile gaming. We can forgive none of the bad decisions in mobile gaming, period, uh-huh. ever, <laughs> done. Agreed. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, but thank you for joining us for episode 102 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, our discussion on uh, optimization and hardware limitations. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.